Hello, my name is Kelsey Wildstone. I'm an electrical engineer by trade, and I've certainly spent a lot of time looking at different electrical engineering designs and how the industry has come about. And so when I discovered the Georgetown steam plant, I was blown away. All of the things here really kind of show you how the industry has changed and evolved from the early pioneers looking at the electrical industry and figuring out how to design and change things to make them better. It's very much like the technology of today with iPhones and computers changing. In fact, sometimes we even say the iPhone 1 or the iPhone 4 to demonstrate the amount of change that happened very quickly and rapidly during that time. Ever since the Edison Electric Lighting Company started operation of the Pearl Street Station on the afternoon of September 4th, 1882, and launched the electrical power industry, demand quickly increased. Engineers struggled to increase both the size and the number of generating units uh, in order to meet this demand. However, they began to run into the practical limits of both the engine and generator size, as well as the buildings to house these units in. As you can imagine, with Pearl Street Station being in Manhattan, they couldn't just keep increasing the size of the building because of other nearby buildings and even the cost of real estate. They had to look at increasing the technology. The Westinghouse Company was certainly looking for the next and greatest thing, and they secured the rights to the Parsons turbine, patented in 1884. This was the first successful industrial turbine, and while it wasn't more efficient, it certainly was much smaller. Westinghouse clearly had the upper hand. They had the only turbine on the market. Then, in September 1896, Charles G. Curtis secured the patents for his Curtis turbine, which was about a tenth the size of previous units. Curtis assigned his patents to his own company, and a year later, entered into a licensing agreement with General Electric. For $1.5 million, General Electric secured the uses of the Curtis turbine for everything except for aerial and marine propulsion. GE even created a new division for development of the Curtis turbine. And until 1900, Charles Curtis himself directed this research. However, GE had become concerned with the lack of progress on this program and considered dropping it. A man named William Leroy Emmett had worked various electrical jobs before joining General Electric in 1892. He knew there were challenges with the Curtis project, but thought the work was extremely important and urged General Electric to continue the progress. So in 1901, Emmett took charge of the program and began development of the engine. Under his leadership and guidance, they developed a vertical design of the Curtis turbine and Emmett had also developed a oil-supported step bearing that was used in the vertical design in order to make it work. Behind me are some of the oil pumps for the oil-supported step bearing that allows the generating unit to sit on top of the turbine. Installed in the Fisk Street Station in Chicago in 1903. The Fisk Street Station was the first powerhouse specifically designed for a vertical turbo generator. And as far as we know, behind me here at the Georgetown Steam Plant are the last two Curtis vertical steam turbine installed in their original location. The Curtis turbine was quickly successful. In the last 12 years that Westinghouse had been selling the Parsons turbine, they had sold about 300,000 horsepower. By comparison, in 1903, General Electric had sold nearly that same amount, about 225,000 horsepower of the Curtis turbines in the first 15 months of sales. This was not without its challenges though. Unit number one, a 3,000 kilowatt unit began operation on August 3rd, 1907. However, a couple of days later, the generating and windings burned out and it was repaired, but the windings burned out three more times in the next three months. Unit number two was installed in December 17th, 1907. However, 
its generating windings burned out on January 7, 1908, and it was not operational again until March. Unit number one in 1911, the smaller unit, had its generator windings rewound from 3,000 kilowatts to 5,000 kilowatts. This was actually not an uncommon procedure. As generator technology became better, they were able to figure out how to get more electrical power out of the same mechanical energy. For both units, you can see the steam turbine part on the bottom of the unit. The steam enters the turbine through the white pipe at approximately 175 PSI. In the middle of the unit is the oil supported step bearing that I mentioned. And then on top of the unit is the generator unit itself. You can see where the wires for the generator leave the generating unit and come down the beautiful brass pipes that are on the side of the unit. These wires then continue down across the engine room and then up to the third floor where we have our switchboard made out of beautiful Vermont blue marble. And sometimes I have people ask me, why did they use marble? There are a couple of pieces of speculation that I offer for this. Number one, everything in this steam plant seems to be built to a very high level of craftsmanship. There are a lot of very fine details in the steam gauges or the brass conduits, things like that. And Vermont blue marble certainly looks great. The other piece that I offer is that in the early days of the electric industry, they may not have known exactly how to insulate the electric, electric components as well. On the top of the switchboard, you can see where the wires are traveling above and they go to the upper floor where there's a set of capacitor banks. If you're wondering why there's capacitor banks, a lot of power plants use capacitance to offset the inductance in electrical loads. Also on the other side of the engine room are the three exciters, both steam and electrically driven, that are used to create the field current inside the generator that allows electricity to be produced. Also located on that side is a 500 kilowatt motor generator pair that is used for creating the 600 volts DC that was used for the interurban railway. The vertical orientation of the Curtis turbine steam generator allowed station operators to save a lot of space, but it didn't always stay that way. Next, you're going to see how they were able to get more capacity out of even yet another smaller package.